Few parts of Australia can boast a more varied concentration of production than the valley of the Hunter River. It contains the largest manufacturing district in New South Wales, outside the city of Sydney. It's the principal supplier of coal for the state's power needs. It provides a quarter of the milk board's total requirement for Sydney and Newcastle. Its wool makes a useful contribution to the national trade balance. It figures largely in the home and export meat trade. It produces some of Australia's finest table wines. Its thoroughbred racing stock is well known throughout the sporting world. It markets a wide miscellany of farm and garden produce. If you look at the map of New South Wales, you will see that the Hunter Valley is a coastal river basin extending inland some 160 miles from the sea at Newcastle. It's formed by a western arc of the Great Dividing Range, together with spurs from the north and south, which tend to mark the area into two parts, giving rise to the terms the Upper Valley and the Lower Valley. The southern boundary is mostly rugged and mountainous, giving way to low hills and undulations on the west, which rise slowly to the Liverpool Range, where some peaks reach 3,000 feet the withered stumps of ancient volcanoes. On the east, the Mount Royal Range rises impressively to Barrington Tops, where Carey's Peak exceeds 5,000 feet. Then it drops abruptly to the lower southern and eastern ridges. The Hunter rises in the Mount Royal Range and flows southwest by way of Aberdeen and Musselbrook to Denman, then easterly to Singleton, Maitland, Raymond Terrace, Hexham and the sea at Newcastle. Its principal tributary in the upper valley is the Goulburn River, flowing from the Great Dividing Range. In the lower valley, it receives the Patterson and Williams Rivers, which rise in the Mount Royal Range. With the further assistance of many lesser rivers and creeks, it drains the largest basin on the New South Wales coast, roughly 7,000 square miles. Through many centuries, these streams, sometimes a mere trickle and sometimes surging torrents, have carved a once extensive tableland into endless ridges and undulations, depositing much of the washed out soil in the lower valley, whose broad flats rank among Australia's richest farming lands. The Glenbourne Dam and others to be built at these points are planned to control the flow and irrigate the flats between Scone and Singleton. The Upper Valley's southern quarter is largely a wilderness of broken ridges and poor sandy soil. But there is good sheep and cattle grazing among the northern and eastern hills. The lower slopes and flats, however, provide outstanding pastures. Wool and fat lamb production dominates the meadow of Cassilis district of rich volcanic soil with some cattle and a little wheat. Beef cattle graze in the Upper Goulburn Valley. Sheep, cattle and bloodstock thrive on the loby pastures of the scone musselbrook singleton district. Some wheat is grown near Scone. Dairying is well distributed throughout the riverlands in both the upper and lower valleys, with fodder crops and vegetables mainly on the lower valley flats. The Pacolbin district near Cessnock is noted for its vineyards and wineries. There are some orchards in the Patterson River hills and among the southern slopes some timber is milled below the range. The Chichester Dam supplies water to Maitland and Newcastle districts. Additional water is pumped to Newcastle from the vast underground catchment in the Tomago Sands. The railway from Sydney to the New England area passes through the valley with branches from Maitland to the north coast and Cessnock. A branch from Musselbrook serves Denman and Meriwa. It crosses the Liverpool Range near Mararundi. Most of the Hunter Valley is within the main coal province of New South Wales, whose areas include Newcastle, Gunnedah, Dubbo and Nara. Extensive coal seams underlie this area, often too deep and in places too poor for satisfactory mining. The main outcrops are the southern coal field in the Wollongong district, the western coalfield in the Lithgow district and the northern coalfield in the Hunter Valley. 
This field, with estimated reserves for many centuries at the present rate of mining, is worked chiefly in the Maitland Cessnock Greeter Coal District and the Newcastle Coal District with more than 50 collieries. There are also several collieries in the Musselbrook District. Hundreds of millions of years ago, this area was covered by the sea in the form of a huge gulf. Part of a great subsidence known as the Tasman Geosyncline. As the ages went by, the great gulf became silted up with vast quantities of material washed into it from the surrounding land. Eventually, all that remained of the ancient sea was an enormous area of swampland. In these swamps, Generation after generation of vegetation left their decaying remains until the whole area was covered by a thick layer of vegetable soil resting on the bed of marine sediments. Once more the land subsided and was covered by the sea a second time. Again it was silted up from the land around and covered by another layer of swamp vegetation and eventually topped off with loam, sand and other rock-forming material. All this took countless millions of years, during which the deposits became compressed into rock and shale and coal. Thus the bed of the Great Depression carries the lower marine series of rock sediments from the first sea, the lower coal measures containing shale and seams of coal from the first swamps, the upper marine series from the second sea, and the upper coal measures. But other forces, which are always at work in the Earth's crust, cause these layers to become folded and bent into synclines and anticlines. At the same time, the wind and the rains were tearing at the surface so that in some places, like the Hunter Valley, the domes of the anticlines were worn down as fast as they were pushed up. Rendering the upper coal measures accessible in the Newcastle stage, and the lower coal measures accessible around the great Lochinvar Dome and the Musselbrook Dome. Today the upper measures are worked in the Newcastle Coal District, the lower measures are worked in the Maitland Cessnock Greeter District and the Musselbrook District. Lower seams of the upper measure are also worked on the southern edge of the Musselbrook Dome. The Newcastle Coal District embraces many centres in the coastal Wall's End Lake Macquarie areas. The Lochinvar Dome, named from the village of Lochinvar, comprises the Maitland Cessnock Greeter Coal District, and together with the Musselbrook District, they provide the valley's most significant activity outside the great manufacturing industries of Newcastle. Now let us examine this great valley starting at the headwaters of the Hunter River. Here, the Mount Royal Range rises towards the high and heavily forested Barrington Plateau. From the northern end of the Great Forest Reserve, the river emerges at Hunter Springs, at an altitude of about 4,000 feet. Sheep and cattle graze on the steep slopes and partly cleared mountain top. Aerial pasture improvement is widely practiced throughout the hilly grazing regions, whose steepness renders other methods impractical or uneconomical. Fertilizer and grass seed mixed together are skillfully dropped to a pattern with excellent results. The productive value of the treated area is often doubled. Two planes working together keep the ground crew constantly active. The river cascades down the mountainside to a narrow valley where cattle graze among the foothills of the range. By the time it reaches the picturesque village of Moonan Flat, it has become a sizable stream. Near Bell Trees, Stewart's Brook comes in from the slopes of the Mount Royal Range where stringy bark and blue gum logs are sawn in a mountain mill. The valley broadens into rolling sheep and cattle lands at Beltries. 
Here we see a fine example of a homestead built shortly after the turn of the century. The locality suits Aberdeen Angus cattle, a breed noted for prime beef. Below Beltrees, the hills close in once more and we come to the Glenbourne Dam, the first completed project in the Hunter River control scheme. The Great Earth Wall stretches across to an isolated hill, beyond which the spillway awaits the flood time overflow. Meanwhile, the river continues from a tunnel beneath the hill. Now it flows through dairy flats and undulating pastures towards Aberdeen. Near Aberdeen, it's joined by the Pages River, which rises on the steep slopes of the Liverpool Range near the town of Murarundi, the valley's most northerly district centre. The New England Highway crosses the range by a low gap. Below, the railway enters the Ard Glen Tunnel, and the valley stretches southward with Murarundi at our feet. Among the district's hilly sheep and cattle runs are several Hereford studs. Herefords are the most popular beef cattle, easily raised and fattened on most pastures. The horns of show bulls are trained downward with weights. A stud just south of Murarundi breeds polled or hornless Herefords. These two-year-old bulls weigh up to 1,900 pounds. Their sire is an aged, unbeaten show champion. Further south is Windron. The Aboriginal name means fire. The nearby Burning Mountain is an outcrop of the Greater Coal Seam. It's believed to have been ignited by lightning many centuries ago. Creeping a few inches each year, the heat cracks new vents which feed air to the smoulderings far below. Yellow sulphur patches mark the ground, which is hot enough to cook a meal. It leaves behind a trail of subsiding land. At Wingen, we enter the dairy lands. Here we see a fine stud-bred herd of Frisian dairy cattle. Frisians are noted for their heavy seasonal milk yield, though generally of moderate butterfat content. The soil research station near Scone serves the valley's conservation needs. Many imported grasses are grown and tested. As in this paddock of African buffalo grass. Many trees are tested and nursery seedlings are distributed freely to landholders. Climatic effects on soil and pastures are scientifically studied. In the laboratory, we see a soil testing machine in operation. Field work includes the laying out and building of anti-erosion contour banks. This machine sets out furrows to guide the bulldozers. The height of banks is determined by the fall of the land. The work is provided at cost price to applicants. And here is a sample of finished contour work. Amid the dairy and pasture lands of the Scone Aberdeen district are some notable studs. Border Leicester sheep are bred for crossing with merinos to produce fat lambs for the meat trade. A shorthorn stud provides a fine strain of breeding stock for the beef cattle industry. Racehorse studs are the feature of the district. Yearlings are prepared for sale with daily lunging to reduce fat and develop sinew. This is the lunging yard. Sejenhoe is one of the valley's historic landmarks. 
From this old homestead, Alan Cunningham set out in 1827 on his most rewarding expedition, when he discovered and named the Darling Downs. The event is recorded on a tablet at Scone. Aberdeen is noted for its meatworks. Here much of the valley's mutton and beef is prepared for local and overseas markets. Just south of Aberdeen is the Milk Board's artificial breeding station for the dairy industry. The process enables each service from a sire to be distributed among 200 cows. Breeding material from selected sires of all leading dairy strains goes to many parts of Australia besides the Hunter Valley and even overseas. It is scientifically tested, packed in dry ice and stored for distribution. Irrigation by underground water is widely used throughout the dairy flats. River water penetrates gravel beds about 50 feet below the surface. Large wells contain electric motors which pump the water to hydrants throughout the property. Portable spray pipes are moved from one hydrant to another. Lucerne is largely grown as a pasture. The surplus is cut and stored in bales. Portable low-voltage electric fences are often used on the dairy lands to control the cattle. Near Musselbrook, we see a fine stud-bred herd of Jersey dairy cattle. Jerseys are noted for a consistent, well-balanced yield of milk and butter fat, a most popular dairy breed. The cows are milked in a typical six or eight bale dairy. Hygiene is guarded by regular government inspection. The milk is collected twice a day. At the local cooperative milk depot, much of it is prepared for delivery to the milk board. The balance passes through this dehydrator which makes powdered milk, largely for export. Here, the hunter reaches Musselbrook, situated on the fringe of the northern coal field. The coal company's nearby open-cut mine works two large seams, which can be seen at different levels. Both are divisions of the greater seam in the lower coal measures. Adjacent is the Electricity Commission's 3.5 megawatt power station. This is the coal company's tunnel mine, whose workings penetrate the seams up to three miles. Skips are drawn from the mine by an endless cable. Continuing through dairy flats, the hunter reaches Denman. Beyond the hilly country, west of the town, lie the valley's principal sheep lands. They stretch westward across the Meadow Cassilis Plateau to the Great Dividing Range. Among the low hills west of Cassilis, we see a flock of stud merino ewes. Together with these magnificent two-year-old rams, they typify the district's breeding stock. Cassilis lies at the foot of the hills. Near the town is Dalkeith, where extensive research in scientific animal husbandry was conducted by the late Sir Frederick McMaster. His gifts to pastoral science include the McMaster Laboratory of the CSIRO at Sydney University. Moving eastward from Cassilis, 
we find that the plateau consists of several shallow parallel valleys running from the Liverpool Range to the Goulburn River. They alternate with low park-like ridges. Beef cattle are raised largely to keep the rank grass down for the sheep. In one of these valleys is Meadower, the principal town of the sheeplands. On a property among the hills to the north of Meadowa, sheep are being mustered for shearing. The shearers' cars are parked in front of their huts. The cook prepares for a dozen hearty eaters. Now the sheep are yarded for drafting into the shearing pens. As shearing proceeds, they enter the shed in batches. Skillful shearers quickly remove the fleece in one piece. The great fleece is thrown across the table for trimming and classing. From the classing bins, it is baled in the hand lever press. Leaving the sheep, we moved southeast into the hill country west of Denman. Here we come to Sandy Hollow on the Goulburn River. The Goulburn skirts the rugged country of the upper valley's southern portion. Among these sandstone ridges, the Widden Valley penetrates southward for some 20 miles. This valley, through which flows the Widden River, a southern tributary of the Goulburn, is one of the most picturesque locations on the Hunter Basin. Its properties include several thoroughbred racehorse studs. Many of these mares, seen here with their foals, have fine turf records. Among the notable sires standing in the Wooden Valley at the time of our visit, we see the golden chestnut stallion Star Kingdom. The King Ranch Plain calls in at their Widden Valley property. King Ranch breeds Santa Gertrudis cattle, a type developed in Texas, USA, from Asiatic Brahmas and Shorthorns. This aged bull from Texas weighed 2,900 pounds in his prime. The breed sweats through the skin like a horse, is suited to hot, dry conditions, and makes excellent beef. The bulls are crossed with Shorthorn cows. These are first cross cows and second cross calves. Every fourth cross reverts to pure Santa Gertrudis. Downstream from Sandy Hollow, the Goulburn enters the colourful dairy lands near Denman. Here it joins the Hunter River, which now turns eastward towards Singleton. It flows on past the village of Jerry's Plains, among dairy flats and hilly pastures. Now it's joined from the south by the Wallumbi Brook, better known to old-timers as the Cockfighter. On this stream, tests are being made for the Walkworth Dam, the second step in river control. Its planned capacity is greater than that of the Glenbourne Dam. The hunter reaches the broad dairy and pastoral lands near Singleton, the upper valley's largest town. Constable Howe arrived in this locality from Windsor in 1820 in search of open land. His party included Benjamin Singleton, who later subdivided part of his grant for a town site. The surveyors used the name of Sydney Streets, which still persist. In the early years of settlement, the Great North Road from Windsor to Singleton via Putty was the only land route to the valley. Reconstructed in more recent times, it is once again a main traffic artery. Below Singleton, the hunter skirts the spurs which come down from the Mount Royal Range. 
while low ridges from the southern mountains cross the valley near the coal towns of Brankston and Greta. From one of these ridges, we look across undulating pastures towards distant Maitland and the floodplain of the lower valley. At Maitland, the river has high levee banks, a reminder of many devastating floods. This spot was once a mere stopping place for bullock teams moving inland from the port of Morpeth. Now, the city of Maitland is the valley's largest rural centre. On its outskirts is a big textile mill. A private railway, founded by coal interests to serve the mines, operates from Maitland. Its distinctive engines with full-length side tanks are familiar on the coal fields. It also provides passenger and freight services to the coalfield town of Curry Curry. And the valley's chief coal centre, Cessnock. Here government authorities administer the mining regulations and guard the health of all mine workers. Constant research is also carried out on the valley's coal resources. This involves the sinking of exploratory bores on many locations. We see the diamond drill head being removed to retrieve one of the many sample cores brought up for analysis. At the laboratory, the test portion is ground to a fine powder. A measured quantity is weighed and tested for ash content, sulphur content and heat value. The resulting report provides a guide for mine development. This model, actually upside down, shows the number of bores drilled in one locality. The base represents sea level from which the bores are measured downward. Markings on the rods show the extent and trend of the seams. At the Coal Association's laboratory, air from the mines is analysed for toxic content and checked for spontaneous combustion. The air is collected by pumping up a football bladder in the mine. Now we visit a big shaft colliery. Beneath the poppet head, the mine cars emerge from the cages. They are tipped on a belt which conveys coal to the washing and grading plant. Unwanted material is removed in a huge revolving flotation drum. Under violent agitation, the coal moves to the washing jets and grading screens. It is then loaded for delivery according to size. This is an all-electric tunnel colliery. The coal comes from the working face on belts. The cable track is for men and materials. All mines have their own rail trucks which are serviced in the mine workshops. For Colbin, near Cessnock, is the valley's chief wine district. Many types of grapes are grown about the hillsides. Annual pruning reduces the vines to two laterals with six buds each. This gives the best yield. The crop is processed in eight wineries, or cellars as they're locally called. This press uses mechanical pressure. A new method inflates a rubber bag among the grapes in a revolving perforated cylinder. The juice runs to settling tanks beneath the floor. Clear wine is drawn off to maturing casks under temperature control and periodically turned by piping from one cask to another. In these vats, dark grapes are fermented in their skins to make red wine. Some special table wines are made in pressure tanks. The Maitland to Morpeth district contains the valley's most intensely cultivated area of river flats. 
Here, countless floods have settled a bed of deep loam rich enough to support a high rate of crop rotation. Vegetable growing predominates in the locality. Produce not suitable for market is ploughed in or fed to pigs, which are the popular sideline on the vegetable farms. Sorghum is largely grown for fodder use. Corn is cultivated in many places. These are bales of millet, familiar in the household broom. The river becomes navigable at Morpeth, once the principal port of the inland area. Rotting timbers of the old wharf are fast disappearing as are remnants of the three-storey wharf building. The Cooperative Milk Company has its bottling depot at Morpeth. Here we see the empty bottles passing into the washing machine. Completely sterilised, they move on to the filling section. The process is completed in one continuous movement which only occupies two or three minutes from start to finish. The Patterson River joins the Hunter close to Morpeth, and seven miles downstream, the Williams River comes in near Raymond Terrace. Both these tributaries rise in the Mount Royal Range at the southern end of the Barrington Tops. The Chichester Dam is on a nearby tributary of the Williams River. It supplies water to the Maitland and Newcastle districts. Cattle raising is the chief pursuit in the upper portions of these beautiful valleys, with dairy farming in the lower parts. The town of Patterson is the principal centre of the Patterson River district. The Williams River District is served by the larger town of Dungog. Both towns are on the North Coast Railway Line. This is Raymond Terrace, once a busy river port and centre of milk and butter production, but now a centre of growing residential and manufacturing interest. A new housing area that accommodates many employees at the local wallboard factory and the large textile mill. In the nearby Grahamstown water scheme, a man-made lake will hold water pumped from the Williams River to meet the growing needs of the Newcastle district. Meanwhile, the 50 square mile Tomago water reserve is worked in conjunction with the Chichester Dam. Twenty field pumps throughout the area raise groundwater to spray basins for removal of gas and other treatment. Secondary pumps drive it to Wadatai Reservoir where it enters the Newcastle reticulation system. At Hexham, gas coal from the Cessnock district is loaded for shipment to Sydney. Here also is the chief depot of the Cooperative Milk Company. A portion of the milk received is devoted to the manufacture of butter. Cheese is also produced. Southeast of Hexham, in the Newcastle Coal District, we see the high-speed electric winding gear of a modern colliery. It raises and lowers the cages over 700 feet in a few seconds. This is the ventilation system. A giant fan is housed in a steel funnel. It draws air from the mine's extremities, causing an intake of fresh air at the pit head. The motor house and air shaft top are to be seen at the rear of the structure. Some mines have separate access shafts to save men miles of travel underground. The buildings contain modern bathhouse and changing facilities. Below Hexham, we enter the Newcastle Metropolitan District and the valley's chief manufacturing area which is also its largest employment and profit-earning factor. 
the steelworks stand out as a landmark among its industries. Shipbuilding is a well-established industry. Diesel-electric locomotives are built in local workshops. And all kinds of heavy castings, such as this hydroelectric valve. Wire ropes of every description are made. Sheet metal is produced for many purposes. Industrial chemicals and agricultural fertilizers are manufactured. Electric lamps and fluorescent tubes and a host of other products, large and small. Much of the valley's wool clip is held in huge stores pending the Newcastle wool sales. The port of Newcastle handles considerable interstate and overseas trade and services ships of many nations. Its big coal shipping and bunkering wharves point to the valley's most notable product. Dredging costs are heavy, involving the annual removal of some two million tons of river silt. The city of Newcastle embraces a well-spread area of residential and industrial suburbs extending for some miles along the southern side of the estuary. The principal administrative and commercial section of the city is located at its eastern extremity. Not far from this point is the seafront, where Lieutenant Shortland's men found coal in 1797 while examining the estuary of a then unnamed river. Lieutenant Shortland named the river. He called it Hunter's River in honour of the Governor. Now it provides the port of Newcastle and the seaward gateway to one of Australia's most productive coastal valleys. <laughs>